everyone. I'm here today to welcome Robert Miller, ceramics professor, um, artist, and gallerist, who will be interviewing um, the well-known sculptor David Pelosi, who's based in uh, the Palm Springs to Joshua Tree area, and we will be talking to him live at his outdoor and indoor studio. Take it away, David and Robert. David, thank you for having us in your home in beautiful Yucca Valley, which for our audience, um, I guess the closest thing is Joshua, Joshua Tree, if I'm correct. Is that kind of the general area? That's it. We're in a small area in the hills, in the outback, and it's called Boulder Ridge. And this is Boulder Ridge Ranch. So this is my outdoor gallery for my big pieces. Over there is my art studio. Now, how long have you been in the Yucca Valley area, David? Um, since 1989. As you're touring, maybe you could sort of tell us about how you got into art and how you've come to this, where you are now. At an early age, I, I really loved art. And I was inspired by a group of artists in Balboa Park. Um, at Spanish Village, where you could actually see the artists working on their mediums. And um, there was a lot of art museums there and public sculpture. And that was just very inspiring. And the art for me was always a, a pleasure. And I, would, I excelled at it in school. So that was the path of least resistance for me. But it was always my passion. So that was where um, my focus has always directed. You were originally started as a ceramicist and you you sort of transitioned into more heavy sculpture. Will you show us some of your sculptures and talk a little bit about the media that you're using? I will. Well, here's a, a large piece of, of travertine. So this is what the block looks like when you begin. And then um, I evaluate the, the piece of stone or I'll pick a, a, one of my blocks from my block inventory. So here is the same type of material, the travertine. And this is a piece that's almost finished. It's called Sunrise and it's a female figurative form. And she's emerging out of, of a sunset or sunrise. And you can see the colors um, flow all the way through and it, it's a very nice desert toned piece. Um, and there you have it, my chisel marks. And then this area has been sanded. Now, are you using like power tools to chisel or are you using grinders? A little bit about how you go about making um, the sculptures. Well, I start with drawings and then I will start off um, using a diamond saw. I make indent cuts and then come back with a big hammer and a big chisel and knock as much as I can off with that. And then I progress from there into smaller and smaller chisels. And then from there I go to sanding discs and sandpaper and then um, polishers. So by the time I'm at a point where I'm worried about um, the detail, I'm using really small chisels and really small hammers. Now for your inspiration, for your artwork. You're in one of the most beautiful places. I mean, that Joshua Tree area, I know you're in Yucca Valley, you know, it's so gorgeous. Does that, do you find that affects your work or, you know, do you find your inspiration somewhere else? I have a collective inspiration from a lifetime as all artists have. But it's, when I moved here and I um, saw how picturesque this area is with the older piled on top of each other and um, the dramatic way the sun will envelop these boulders. Um, I couldn't help but be inspired by, um, by the beauty of the area. Now, I see a lot of your work is using stone. I have been collecting stones since I was in my late 20s and I, I have an, a lot of material. So most of the time I have what I need here already on my property. On occasion I'll have to, if somebody wants something in, 
let's say black, for instance, and I don't have black, then I have to seek that out um, and find a, a quarry that will have that material. But most of the time I have what I, um, what I have what I need. And then from that point on, um, you know, I have a couple of forklifts. I load it onto my truck, bring it up here to my studio, set it up. If it's a big piece, I'll have a, a, a little scaffolding around it or use stairs. I have a building over there that I um, can do my carving in. Now you're, I mean, you're moving major stuff and you're doing these really incredible sculpture um, sculptures that, which is wonderful, that can be indoors, outdoors. And it's really this beautiful um, hybrid of stone and glass. And I know you incorporate water. Where do you envision them going into? Each piece has its own kind of look and design and um, I guess compatibility with different architecture. So um, quite often I have the luxury of doing site specific work. So I'm visiting a person's uh, home and then I, I can even often visit the site, bring a tape measure, measure the area. And then um, from, from there, I can go on to uh, making a piece that um, I think would be perfect for the site. You seem to ha be able to, which a lot of artists can't, almost have three different bodies of work. Will you talk about the little, the differences in the work and why you do it? Well, it, early on in my um, career, I started doing just stone sculpture with only stone. And then, um, I think in the, the, the late 80s, I started incorporating glass and the glass would symbolize water and kind of a living human spirit in the, in the work. So over the years, the, the more, I started using more and more glass until the glass became a significant part of the, the balance of materials. I was in San, living in San Diego I spent a lot of time around the water. Um, this is called Land and Sea, and it's inspired by the, the waves and sort of a, uh, the beginning or a monument to this uh, genesis of all creation. But that, the stone and glass follow, has followed me. And um, now I do a lot of pieces that are figurative pieces. And those forms are, um, they'll have a volume of glass and the glass in those pieces is symbolic of the human spirit. So this, this sculpture is called the uh, Heaven and Earth, and it was inspired by a Chinese coin where the symbolism in the coin is the circle is heaven and the, the square is earth. And I, um, I saw this coin and was inspired and made a really, I've made a series of those, but this is the largest one to date in limestone. Now, being a art and public place artist, how do you want your audience to interact and view with your art? And while well, I'm throwing it in there, where is your dream sort of spot to, you know, where would you really like your work to be seen? I think when I, over the years, it was always my, um, you know, sort of a, objective or goal to have large pieces in front of public buildings or in public spaces. And it's kind of an ego thing, I think, to do very large pieces. And um, I also, in the back of my mind, knew that when I was a, 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 young, a young kid, it was the public art that I saw in Balboa Park, particularly sculptures done by a guy by the name of Donald Ford. Um, fantastic stone sculptor in limestone and granite. And um, so what's nice about the public pieces is all people can see them. They, they don't need to be affluent kids that tag along with their affluent parents into galleries. Um, but the public art is for people. And that's always been important to me because um, I want to share what I do with everyone. Um, a lot of my work obviously ends up in collectors' homes, and it's only seen by the, the art collector and their family and friends, or if they entertain. But the, the public pieces are there for everyone. Now, do you want, I, I see your pieces, especially like the coin series, you know, like that. 
and kids will want to touch it, interact with it. People will want to. Um, how do you feel about that as an artist? Do you want it when you? Uh, yeah, it's great. It, it's for my own um, community here. I did a a, a large installation, uh, maybe thirty tons of stuff, and I created a piece for our community that was built out of a series of blocks, and it had the local animals carved into it, larger than life and. Uh, it, it, for me, it gave a window for our community into not only the animals that we have here, but the indigenous peoples that were wandering um, prior to um, the settlers coming to the area. So I catered that piece to people that would be um, the local people mainly who'd be seeing it, and then hopefully inspiring them to appreciate how amazing this area is because a lot of people don't know the history, especially people who've grown up here. Um, they don't appreciate it as much as um, people who, um, you know, are coming in from other areas. So that that part of the public art is important. And, and having stone sculpture is, um, is nice because it's not as affected by um, vandalism and things like that. Now, when, Art goes in public, you know, there's usually some conservation, some maintenance. Is it supposed to age with the environment? You know, stone does age a little bit. Is that part of it? How do you see your work sort of aging and progressing? I prefer that my uh, sculptures are, are maintained by the, the entity that ends up with it. Early on in the 80s, I, I was hired to work on that. Um, well-known sculpture at the courthouse in Santa Barbara. And it was disintegrating and because it was old and because the, the water from the pond was percolating up into the stone. And I got to spend some, some weeks on that piece. And while I was doing it, um, I got to contemplate how important it is to do your best as an artist, to have your things um, survive over time. Now, your work is very sought after as a sculptor and a public art and public place artist. What do you think your collectors respond to? What do you think is sort of the magic that's going on that's working for you? Well, I am, I make a sculpture, mainly residential sculpture for um, spectacular homes. And my pieces end up being the focal point, that dramatic focal point that is positioned in a way so that um, when a person is viewing it, hopefully they're getting um, a dramatic physical feeling that transcends uh, just a piece of pretty art. I want my pieces to, uh, to wow the viewer. And I think that um, when people see the, the body of my work in my portfolio or online, a lot of people are after that. They're after that one piece that's gonna be in an entryway or on the edge of a vanishing edge pool or between a golf course and their home. And they're gonna, I'm gonna position that sculpture where it can be viewed from as many angles as possible to maximize that, uh, um, that feeling that the collector will get. And I think I've, I've, uh, I've developed a skill to evaluate a site, to um, communicate well with my collector, and to, throughout the process, make it a really fun thing. I met you at the Beverly Hills Art Show, and you've been participating since, was it the 80s? Yeah, May of, May of 87. So, what keeps bringing you back to this art show over and over again? And is that the primary, primary way you show your art? I started doing art shows. My first one was in May of 87, and I was looking for a way to sell my work so that I could be meeting my clients face-to-face. -face. In a gallery setting, you rarely will meet your collector. I get a lot of satisfaction out of meeting 
my collectors, they become friends. I've known many of them for many, many years. And um, it's, it's just great. So the Beverly Hills show, um, I s discovered it in 87. Um, at that point, I realized that um, it was a good fit for me. I like the casual atmosphere where I'm outside, people are all different age people are, are coming by. Um, I enjoy talking to people. It's been my primary way of meeting my collectors. Uh, on occasion, I'll have a gallery owner that will refer their, um, their client to me. Here's an interesting one. Some painters I know have sold paintings and they're like, I, I need to make an update on your painting. Have you ever had that where like, you've sold this piece and it's with a collector's stone and you're like, it's missing. I, I got to change it. I got to do something. H has that occurred in your work? Never. Yeah, I never change anything once it's placed. I might have to move a piece on occasion, but uh, I don't change my designs once they're once they're once they're carved in stone. They're carved in stone. <laughs> now you also have artists in your family. You're not the only artist. Will you talk a little bit about that? And you have several children. Yeah, I have a large family, and all of my kids are exceptional, remarkable, amazing um adults and they are all creative in their own way one of my boys christopher is a stone sculptor and he's been carving stones since he was about 13 and he's 20 now and he does amazing work that's exciting is that the one behind you i believe yeah yeah that's the so that beautiful beautiful sculpture what does making art mean to you can you talk a little bit about how not only the process you go through, but how it, I think the personal side is really important too. Like how, has it changed because you have to do all that? Do you still find that same enjoyment? After I um, had a family, the, my art, the art process and the experiencing, uh, experience of being an artist does change a bit because you, ha you have mouths to feed and bills to pay. So I think I've known a lot of artists that are very skilled and talented, but without the pressure of having to make it all work, they follow the path of getting a job somewhere else. So then they're producing less, exhibiting less. And in my case, I had this desire, a burning passion to, to get really good at um, my craft. That, along with knowing you better produce or you're not going to be able to keep this going. It's been a motivating factor. So a lot of it is artistic inspiration. And a lot of it is, um, having to make it all work. If you'd like the audience to know anything really about you or about your work, you know, is there anything you want to kind of finish on that, that you really want them to know about you, your sculpture and your process? Well, I have, I, I have some drawings here. We were talking about the process and I dug through some old drawings and you have to do that and you have to be pretty good at it. I'm fortunate to have a, a, a filmmaker's son. So he's been helping me with a lot of my Photoshopping over the years. So my proposals are pretty good. To be able to do all this and manage and organize that you do so well is so important. David? Thank you so much for sharing your time and your home with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Karen. And the rest of the Beverly Hills staff who helped uh, go through all this trouble to bring the show to me or for, <laughs> for them to bring my show to you.